Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's June 2020, and you're listening to Episode 185, which is a spoiler-filled conversation about the CBS All Access Star Trek streaming television series, Picard. On this episode, I'm joined by longtime journal author Robert Velarde, who is the author of several books, including A Visual Defense, Conversations with C.S. Lewis, and The Wisdom of Pixar. He received his M.A. from Southern Evangelical Seminary and has served as an adjunct faculty member at Denver Seminary. Robert has written an online exclusive article for the Christian Research Journal, and you can read it completely free at our website, equip.org, and his article is called Star Trek, Picard and Transhumanism, Where No One Has Gone Before. Robert, it's good to have you on. Great to be on again, Melanie. Well, Picard is a new series in the whole Star Trek franchise, which actually started on television back in the 1960s, so more than 50 years ago. And it was just launched this year in 2020, and it's available on um, streaming on CBS All Access. And it was really interesting because I was looking, I'm a person who likes to see movies. And so I was looking at the credits and I saw a credit and I said, is that correct? That person's a well-known novelist. And of course they have some interesting people that are involved with this series. So it's kind of, I guess, rebooting some of the characters that have been in past franchise series. And one of those, it's, it's named after one of those namesakes, which is um, Jean-Luc Picard, who is a captain of the Enterprise in the Star Trek kind of timeline. But before we talk about this series in particular, why don't we go back because it's been so long. Can you share a little bit of history for about Star Trek and its creator, Gene Roddenberry, and some of its key ideas? Because I think there's some people who are obviously younger than the original series with William Shatner back in the 60s that might not, you know, know really what the basis of this particular series was. Sure. Well, as you mentioned, uh, started out as a television series back in 1966, uh, really only ran for three seasons and sort of disappeared until the late 70s when uh, they came out with a, a movie uh, based on Star Trek and then uh, several sequels. Uh, you know, there was a, a reboot of a television series in the 80s with Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, so it's been around, you know, quite a long time. You know, there's a, a wide variety of, of fans, too. You know, the ones that are called the Trekkers, the Trekkies, you know, are sort of you know, very into the program uh, and all its variations that have been around since. Um, you know, really one of its key ideas is basically that the future of humanity is a good thing. It's uh, humans united. They've seemingly created this peaceful society that's focused on human betterment you know, these uh, emphasis on scientific technological advancement, space exploration. Uh, in other words, it, it offers a very optimistic view of humanity, uh, which really is a contrast to a lot of science fiction that is typically dystopian. You know, you think of something along the lines of, say, the Terminator franchise, you know, where you've got this dark future. And Gene Roddenberry, the creator of Star Trek, you know, he had, um, you know, a different approach. He wanted to kind of present this uh, positive view of where humanity could end up uh, if they, if people decided to sort of, you know, work together and make some progress. So now we're fast forwarding from back in the 60s all the way to now with this new series. And so as I mentioned, the main character of this Star Trek Picard is a character that appeared more than 30 years ago in the show Star Trek The Next Generation that you talked about briefly. Can you describe that show and the character Picard, Jean-Luc Picard, and kind of bring us up to date before we get into the actual new series based on him? Sure. And, you know, it's important to point out that uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, it was a reboot, in a sense, of the original series, although, you know, it took place 
uh, within the Star Trek universe, uh, you know, almost a century after the original series, you know, with Kirk and Spock and some of those characters that are, you know, iconic from the original show. Um, and, you know, ran for seven seasons and um, also spawned a number of movies, you know, including uh, the most, uh, I think the final one that featured the Next Generation cast was a film called Star Trek Nemesis uh, back in the early 2000s. And the uh, series Star Trek Picard is set about 18 years after that motion picture. So it's set uh, within the Star Trek world in the year 2399. You have the character Jean-Luc Picard, who is no longer in this, you know, Starfleet uh, organization. He's a retired admiral. Uh, He's sort of just kind of uh, living out his life on his uh, chateau in France, you know, where he's got this wine vineyard. Um, So... A lot of it, um, you know, I would say, you know, does rely on, well, do you know what happened before? But in general, you know, the show is definitely watchable for someone who, for instance, isn't familiar familiar with a lot of this previous content or storyline. So what exactly is this new series, Star Trek Picard, about? Well, it, uh, you know, like I said, takes place after the film Star Trek Nemesis, you know, maybe about 18, 20 years later. And it's largely about this character who was an android character in Next Generation in some of the movies, this character named Data, who in the film Star Trek Nemesis sort of sacrifices himself to save others. And in Star Trek Picard, uh, Jean-Luc Picard is still sort of grappling with this loss of Data. And during this time, uh, this young woman shows up to visit him and he realizes that she's a synthetic life form that has some sort of connection to the character of Data. Uh, So a lot of the story is Picard trying to discover, um, you know, what's going on with this this new android who uh, actually is killed, you know, pretty early on in the series. And uh, Picard discovers, well, there's a twin to this android. There's another one. So his quest is sort of to find out uh, where is this other android, what's its connection to Data, who created these androids, because in the Next Generation series, Data was sort of a a unique android character. Uh, No one, in in other words, had ever been able to create an android as lifelike or as human-like as Data was. You talked about a few minutes ago the Star Trek movie franchise and then this one is picking up like 18 years after the events of the last film that this particular new generation cast was in so is there another film in the works because i noticed some of the executive producers on this film have been involved in some of the jj abrams star trek films for example yeah well you know as you know uh, i think it was back in 2009 uh jj abrams uh well-known director and producer you know, rebooted the whole Star Trek uh, movie franchise, you know, with a film that was just called Star Trek, uh, followed by a couple of sequels, you know, Star Trek Into Darkness, and I believe it was 2016, it was Star Trek Beyond was the most recent film. Um, From what I've heard, they want to do a fourth one. It's sort of in pre-production, you know, possibly a film that could be in production later this year, 2020, or possibly next year. Uh, but there's nothing really concrete going on right now. I think as far as new Star Trek material, you know, you have the Star Trek Picard show, which has already been renewed for a second season, and the program uh, Star Trek Discovery, uh, which I believe has uh, been renewed for a third season as well. So you were saying that you didn't think that somebody who's brand new to the franchise would necessarily have to understand what went before if you're going to watch Picard but at the same time it kind of drops you right down into the middle of there's certain like you know quote-unquote good guys and bad guys and um, in terms of alien races although I know that the whole point of Star Trek like you mentioned is very humanistic in nature you know in terms of all races living in harmony and that kind of thing so do we have to know who the particular players are to understand what the stakes are that they kind of lay out at, at, in the series? Well, not strictly speaking. I think it helps somewhat to sort of enhance, you know, the viewing experience. You might see some connections and nuances or recognize some characters or even some ideas. 
Um, you know, back in the 80s, there was an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation called The Measure of a Man. And that actually offers a lot of insights in setting up the show Picard as to, you know, how the character Picard views androids, you know, as well as debates about their status. You know, are these just, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, property of Starfleet? Are they some sort of new life form in their own right? Uh, there's also, you know, a number of cameos from previous Star Trek shows. Um, you know, a lot of the alien races that show up in Star Trek Picard have been ones that have been around for decades. You know, you've got these uh, aliens called the Romulans. You've got these uh, cybernetic uh, organisms called the Borg. So some of that lore, I guess you could call it, is in Star Trek Picard. Uh, but it's really its own kind of self-contained 10-episode series in its own right. You know, we're talking about some of its themes, and it's been known to have generally, you know, positive outlook on human potential and progress. I mentioned it's very humanistic in nature, and I'm sure its view of religion is not all that positive. So is there anything about this particular view of, you know, harmony and human potential and humanism that is at odds with Christianity? Well, I would first say that, uh, you know, the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, was uh, fairly overtly, I would say, a humanist. Um, you know, in the mid-80s, he, you know, even joined the American Humanist Association. Uh, so you do have that kind of thread going for it, you know, this this humanistic approach that, um, you know, by definition, um, really just excludes anything supernatural, anything religious. Uh, it's sort of... Um, you know, human beings getting uh, ahead on their own steam, you know, some emphasis on human potential. Um, so the viewpoint itself, you know, the, this positive outlook on human progress isn't strictly speaking at odds with Christianity. You know, Christians are hopeful uh, as well, you know, knowing that ultimately God is going to heal our broken world, overcome evil and suffering uh, and so forth. Uh, I think the difference here is that in Star Trek, you have this self-directed salvation uh, based on humanism rather than Christianity's savior-based focus. Uh, I would also add, you know, Christianity provides the rationale for objective moral values, whereas uh, one could make a strong case that humanism um, just doesn't have that. It doesn't have the, the robust foundation uh, for ethics that Christianity offers. So what is the difference between how Christianity views the nature of human beings and how Star Trek in its like humanism in terms of harmony between all different kinds of races and and that's represented by the various different alien races on it relevant to talking about this particular series Picard? Well, I think it's really uh, crucial to understand the nature of human beings. It really will lead one to um, some very different uh, conclusions, you know, based on what people think human beings are. You know, if we don't know who or what we are as human beings, we won't have a clear answer about any related ethical questions, philosophical issues, theological matters. Um, you know, there are serious consequences, for instance, if we agree with naturalism and hold that human beings are just matter and the result of some undirected, impersonal process. But if human beings are created by God, and therefore we have this inherent value, uh, there's definitely some clear ethical parameters for what we ought and ought not to do. You know, for instance, do we have a soul or not? Is the brain simply an organ, or is there an immaterial mind? Is it, you know, something good for humans to pursue to try to sort of escape death, or to, uh, in other words, uh, apply science and technology in such a way that, you know, we're messing with things that we maybe shouldn't. You're listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest is Robert Velarde, and we're talking about the CBS All Access Star Trek streaming series called Picard. He's written an online exclusive review about it, and you can read it for free online at our website, equip.org. His article is called Star Trek, Picard and Transhumanism, Where No One Has Gone Before. I'd also like to invite you to help keep this podcast free by supporting us by getting 
a subscription to our magazine. You can do that at our website, equip.org for thirty three fifty, or also at our website, you can give us a tip for $3, $5, $10, a smaller amount if a full subscription is not in your budget right now. Just go to our landing page, equip.org, go to magazine and click on that. And at the drop down menu, you'll see Postmodern Realities Podcast. Click on that and go to the landing page for the episode on Picard or frankly, any episode, and you can find a link where you can help us to keep our content free by giving us a tip. But the best way you can help us, which is completely free to you, except for a few minutes of your time, is to give us a review. And you can do that by going to Apple Podcasts. There's two ways to give us a review. A really speedy way is just click how many stars you'd like to review us, which we hope is five stars. And the other way is to take a few minutes and write a short written review about the podcast, why you subscribe to the podcast, why you like this podcast, why other people should listen to it regularly and subscribe to it as well. And I know a lot of times we've been thinking about doing something, we never get around to it. Just please go ahead right now and go over there and give us a written review. It's even better than a starred one, but we'd take either or both. So we thank you for the support of this podcast. A few moments ago, you were talking about a character called Data that's kind of essential to moving this plot along in Picard. And there's a major part of the storyline in the series that has to do with synthetic life, um, AI, you know, robots who are almost uh, human-like. So how is this particular, the synthetic life presented in the show and, you know, what did you think about that? And it's interesting because it seems like there's a fascination right now in general with AI on TV, whether it's various different films like Her or um, just other different shows that are out right now that are, there's one called Humans about AI robots and they're called synths. So there seems to be, this seems to be a theme right now in terms of people exploring the differences between AI and humans. And so in this particular show, how is it presented? Sure. And yeah, that is something that, um, you know, is a recurring exploration in science fiction storylines. You know, the reboot of the Battlestar Galactica series, for instance, sort of grappled with some of those issues. You know, are these synthetic uh, creatures, you know, are are they uh, life forms in their own right? Or, you know, even the program uh, Westworld, which I haven't seen, I believe explores some of those questions as to, you know, are these beings sort of a new life form or not? And in Star Trek Picard, I would say it presents, uh, you know, some opposing views on synthetic life. Uh, You know, first, Picard definitely himself views synthetic life as essentially life or new life. And as such, he believes these synthetic creatures deserve the same rights as other life forms. And this is something that goes back to that 1989 episode, The Measure of a Man, where Picard makes the case that, you know, Data is, you know, a a life form in his own right. And, of course, the opposing viewpoint is uh, actually quote from that old show is Data is a toaster. So you've got these opposing viewpoints, you know, is this synthetic life? you know, actually life or not. And it's interesting that in Star Trek Picard, the villains are portrayed as the ones that are opposing any kind of synthetic life, you know, viewing them as essentially as machines. So you've kind of got this tension in Star Trek Picard of, well, this is a life form uh, versus no, it's not a life form. Um, So that's, uh, you know, an ongoing tension in the program. Robert just mentioned Westworld, and I also wanted to let our Listeners, know if you're new to this podcast, we have done a podcast on Westworld and also have a feature article about that television show that's on HBO. In your review of Picard, you kind of get into the topic of transhumanism. So what is transhumanism and how is it depicted in this series? Sure. You know, that's a good question. And Picard is a bit slow in getting to this topic, but it finally does get there near the end of the series. And, um, you know, transhumanism is essentially the view that human beings can transcend their current limitations. In other words, the human body and mind, for instance, are perceived as, as limitations. 
and transhumanism wants to go beyond that, uh, typically through applying some sort of uh, science and technology. So in Star Trek Picard, transhumanism, um, you know, is fairly overt, and I believe it's the final episode. Uh, you know, character dies, and um, what they call his neural image or consciousness is transferred into this uh, this other body, and therefore, you know, the character is said to be, you know, still alive. So transhumanism is that core idea of trying to um, prolong life or even become immortal, but uh, doing it through some sort of technological advancements that uh, essentially would allow humans to uh, um, cheat death or delay death or somehow copy their essence or consciousness into something else to allow it to continue. But are there any ethical problems with that for a Christian? I mean, what would be wrong with transhumanism? Well, for Christianity, I mean, there's a lot of problems you would have with transhumanism. Uh, you know, first of all, we'd say that, you know, um, when uh, someone dies, um, you know, that's it, you know, for, for, hu- for a Christian perspective in the sense of, you know, if we look at a passage like Hebrews 9.27, you know, we're appointed to die once, then comes judgment. You know, when we die, our immaterial soul enters God's presence. Um, so there's that, you know, problem. You know, we're sort of taking, um, you know, end of life uh, issues into our own hands, trying to prolong them. Um, you know, there's a variety of other issues, I would say, that you have with transhumanism. You know, is this transferred consciousness for instance, really the same person. You know, what happens if the consciousness is copied many times or if the original source of this consciousness continues to live? You know, do you have multiple people that are the same person, uh, even though they can continue to have different experiences? Um, You know, a lot of ethical questions related to it, too. You know, are people going to be born or made? Uh, Can this lead to some sort of eugenics sort of issues where, uh, you know, there's some sort of uh, decisions made as to what traits are desirable and what aren't or what kind of people want to be produced. So there are definitely a lot of issues going on there. Um, you know, transhumanism itself, I would say, is definitely uh, something that is far off in the sense of, um, you know, do people really want to say, hey, cut my arm off and give me some kind of enhanced or augmented robot arm? Um, you know, this is the stuff of science fiction, cyberpunk fiction, you know, going back to the 80s and in other ways. Uh, but there are, you know, core group of individuals. I, I wouldn't say they're by any means mainstream at this point, uh, but they want to see this progress. They want to see transhumanism allow human beings to, you know, sort of escape their their physical natures. So are there other ways in which this transhumanistic worldview is different from a Christian worldview? Um, Yeah, I would say, you know, in Christianity, you have human death that entered the world as a result of human depravity, or we could say sin. You know, it wasn't the original intent. Uh, The story of Christianity is one of God's love and grace and redemption you know, redeeming essentially what what is broken. Uh, you know, immortality in Christianity is uh, because of God, not our own pursuit of some way to escape or cheat death. So through Christ's death and resurrection, Christians overcome the fear of death. Um, you know, we are not finite beings. Uh, we're destined for immortality. You know, as C.S. Lewis put it in his sermon, The Weight of Gro- Glory, you know, we um, are you know, these uh, everlasting splendors, you know, uh, you know, we're going to be beings that will live forever, uh, as opposed to, say, nations that are going to rise and fall. Um, So from a Christian perspective, transhumanism really isn't uh, something that we should even want to pursue. Um, You know, it's, it's tends to be couched in a humanistic, naturalistic worldview that uh, wants to, you know, as I said, overcome Uh, perceived human limitations. So what about people who believe that science will progress to a point where AI can think and can be 
humans and can make a human in the sense that it can make ethical decisions and so forth, kind of like the way in which Picard saw data. Um, what if it were to get to that real per point, you know, how would that affect Christianity and, and a Christian worldview? Sure. And um, in my mind, it's a bit similar to the question of, well, hey, what will happen if uh, alien life is discovered? You know, what will, what will that have effect will that have on Christianity? Well, in a similar sense, you know, first I'd say it's extremely unlikely that transhumanism is going to progress to that point. Uh, but let's say it does. You know, one day a claim is made that human consciousness or neural image or essence, whatever you want to call it, is is copied or implanted into some sort of synthetic body. Uh, this itself, you know, wouldn't disprove Christianity. You know, I would say that all the arguments for God's existence, for Christ, for the Christian worldview would remain intact. I think, if anything, uh, progress in relation to transhumanism uh, would simply be another indicator of what happens to human beings when uh, they kind of separate themselves from God, when they step out of the bounds of uh, objective moral law. Um, you know, we need to keep in mind that transhumanist ideas could move from the fringes into more mainstream ideas. You know, even this genre of cyberpunk, uh, which started in the 80s, you know, posits this augmenting or replacing human organs and limbs with technologically advanced ones. You know, will we get to the point where people might choose to replace their functioning human hand or arm or eyes or whatever? Uh, you know, that remains, I would say, the stuff of science fiction. Uh, but uh, underlying that, you know, if human beings remove themselves from God's moral laws, you know, anything is is possible as far as uh, ethics is concerned. Well, I want our listeners to know, make sure you go, depending on where you get your podcasts, make sure you go to our website, equip.org, and at the landing page for this episode, we will have links to other articles that we have published on transhumanism and AI as well. Well, finally, I want to end on a note of asking Robert some fun rapid fire questions for him. So, Robert, we want to know cake or pie. Oh, I would have to say cake for sure. Yep. Can't beat the German chocolate cake. Well, I know that you live someplace where there's seasons. So what's your favorite season of the year? Uh, I would have to say winter, which is uh, contrary to what some people would say. But, you know, I grew up in uh, Los Angeles area, Southern California, uh, where it seemed like it was sunny all the time. So uh, I definitely enjoy uh, a nice winter storm, as long as I'm not stuck driving in it. Cats or dogs? Both. <laughs> yeah, my uh, household is has three cats and a German Shepherd. So I guess if I had to pick, I definitely uh, love my German Shepherd. And physical book or ebook? Oh, that's a tricky one. I have so many books in my house. Uh, I've had to stop um, adding to my physical book library. Uh, I think just for the convenience, uh, ebooks just for the, the sensation of actually holding that object in your hand. I, I have some, some great books in my collection, that um, physical books that I wouldn't ever give up. Well, thanks, Robert, for being a guest on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thanks for having me on. You've been listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest has been Robert Velarde, who's written an online exclusive feature article for us, which is a review of the CBS All Access streaming television series, Star Trek Picard. His article is called Star Trek, Picard and Transhumanism, where no one has gone before. And you can read it for free online at our website, equip.org. We'd like to hear from you, so connect with us on social media, like the Bible Answer Man Facebook page and follow CRI, Christian Research Journal, Hank Hanegraaff, and the Bible Answer Man on Twitter. And please subscribe to the Bible Answer Man channel on YouTube. If you like this episode, please subscribe to the Postmodern Realities podcast on iTunes. And please rate and review our podcast. When you rate and review our podcast, it helps others see our content. And please share this episode on your social media accounts. Be sure you tune in daily to the Bible Answer Man broadcast hosted by CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, who answers your questions live on air. To ask Hank a question, call 888-ASK-HANK, Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. In addition, 
head to iTunes and subscribe to Hank Unplugged, Hank's audio podcast. Follow Hank off the grid where he has in-depth conversations with some of the brightest minds discussing topics you care about. So until our next Christian Research Journal author conversation, thanks for listening to the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Mm-hmm.